like a furry torpedo to the jugular. This is Honey Badger Radio, radio with bite. Hello and welcome to Honey Badger Radio. We apologize for the bit of the delay in, in the music. Um, unfortunately, we're having a bit of uh, technical difficulties in the back room, but we seem to have sorted that all out now. I'm your host, Allison Tienan, better known as Telephone Blue. With me today is my stalwart co-host, Hannah Wallen, as well as Sage Gerard, known as Victor Zen on YouTube. As always, I'm going to take a moment now to demand that you, our legions of evil, pony up some cash so we can keep the ziggurat of doom pumping out mind control rays. It doesn't have to be much, just $5 will do. Evil is not funky. You can donate through our website at www.honeybadgerbrigade.com. Also, if you have and you'd like to volunteer, please write, if you can write or draw or animate or have an interest doing website work, please do drop us a line. You can get us at Honey Badgers Brigade, or sorry, Honey Badgers Radio at gmail.com. That honey, that is Honey Badgers with an S, radio at gmail.com. I'd like to take a moment to give thanks to the radio technician who offered his services. And if we ever have enough filthy lucre to upgrade our show to a Meet Space, so Meet Space Studio, we will certainly be using those services. So thanks again, anonymous radio technician. By the way, we don't have those funds because you evil bastards are stingy. What does a woman need to do to get a dollar thrown her way? Damsel? Speaking of damseling for hire, as we all know, St. Sarkeesian saves, and the main topic tonight is Anita will save us from our sins. But before we talk about your relationship with Anita and what he, she can do to bring you to the light, we have a special guest. With us tonight is Paulette McDonald. Paulette is a longtime advocate for shared parenting in Canada. She also represents Leading Women for Shared Parenting. Leading Women for Shared Parenting's website can be found in the show notes beneath the blog talk player. Welcome, Paulette. Please tell us a bit about Leading Women for Shared Parenting. Hello, everyone. All the way from Canada over here. Yeah, we're all are, really. Well, Oh, no, just me today. tonight. Usually we have a couple more Canadian hosts, but tonight it's just me. Go ahead. Well, basically, Leading Women for Shared Parenting is an uh, international organization uh, whose supporters recognize that children need both parents in their lives, especially after divorce or separation. And basically, our purpose is that we believe in the absence of abuse like abandonment, children's desires, needs, and interests are best served when they grow up loving equally and equally loved by both of their parents. Uh, further, children benefit equally from the diversities of both mothers and fathers and from the maximum involvement of both parents. There are millions of family members, both men and women, who have violently suffered the loss of children they loved and cared deeply about as a result of misguided laws and family court practices which systematically restrict a child's access to just one parent and half of their extended family members. Both children and families deserve better than to be forced into an adversarial process with policies that encourage the, the minimization of one parent in the lives of their children. It is our aim to change this system. The f is endorsing our statement, which can be found on uh, our website on the About page, which is basically the home page. As soon as you uh, type in LW, the number 4, SP.org, it'll bring you right up to our home page. And the statement that we're asking you and all our viewers to endorse is uh, shared parenting is an issue which knows no bounds. It is neither the domain of conservatives or liberals, poor or wealthy, and pays no attention to ethnicity or gender. The issue transcends all demographics. Our goals are shared and should be supported across all sectors of society. Children benefit most from the active involvement of both parents, regardless of their marital status. 
the undersigned recognize that absent issues of abuse, neglect, or abandonment, government policy and laws must be structured in such a way as to maximize the opportunity of all parents to contribute to the social, emotional, intellectual, physical, moral, and spiritual development of their children. Yeah. Now, we do currently have an equal parenting bill a private member's bill, which is a federal bill for equal share of parenting. Its number is C-560. We're asking all Canadians to contact their members of parliament and ask them to support this bill. Yeah, yeah. so uh, Paula, could you give us uh, your website address again? LW4SP.org. Okay, so I ask everybody in the audience tonight, well, particularly the Canadians, to direct your direct your browsers to lu4sp.org and sign that petition because this is really important to to start getting moving on these issues and start getting breaking down this adversarial relationship between uh, mothers and fathers in the courts and uh, bringing some justice to children so they don't have to say goodbye to one of their parents during a divorce. Um, Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say absolutely. Just a quick summary on this bill. This enactment amends the Divorce Act to replace the concept of custody orders with that of parenting orders. It instructs judges when making a parenting order to apply the principle of equal parenting unless it is established that the best interests of the child would be substantially enhanced by allocating parental responsibility other than equally. And basically on the the bill itself, it, it forms that should they decide that equal shared parenting isn't appropriate for that particular family, then they have to write the reasons why. So we're we're hoping to eliminate a lot of false allegations, for starters, uh, in the context of family law or family courts. uh, The numbers in terms of false allegations are in the 70 percentile, which is incredibly high. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it definitely, people's uh, spidey senses, senses would be tingling when someone's making an accusation in an acrimonious divorce. Absolutely. And, and these accusations, well, I, I recall on the previous show, because you were also talking on uh, Revelations with Aaron Pizzi about, about this initiative as well, that you were suggesting that it would probably be a good idea to, to make um, issues of lucidity a criminal um, uh, a, a, or losing or having um, being a charge with abuse of your children to be proven to a criminal standard rather than whatever the standard is in family court now. Um, right. And I, I definitely agree with that. It, it, it really is too easy to remove uh, parents, good parents from their children's lives through false allegations. And Correct. The, the standard needs to be higher. And um, did you have anything else you wanted to add to what you said so far about your organization and about the bill and about your aims? Um, well, just that, and this is uh, my opinion. Now, we did touch on uh, criminalizing uh, parenting behaviors such as parental alienation and hostile aggressive parenting, which our courts right now basically reward parents that do this type of behavior. You definitely you know what I mean. Well, I think, yeah. I think a lot of people in the audience definitely know what you mean. Uh, I mean, just off the top of the head, I remember one particular court case, I believe it was in the UK, where the, the, uh, the uh, judge essentially said that the mother was not, would not allow the father to have a relationship with their children. And uh, because she wouldn't allow it, and there was no way that she would ever be peaceable about about their her children or what she considered her children having a relationship with their father, the judge granted custody to her. And it was just it just boggles your mind that 
uh, in this case, a mother, in many cases, a mother can just be so obstinate and unwilling to work with the process, and she gets rewarded for that. Absolutely. Instead this of is punished. how our system works. Yeah, I'm going to bring on Hannah, because um, I believe she has to add to this. Go ahead, Hannah. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I've actually been working on an article about this. I'm not going to try to read the whole thing, but I do have a summary here. Um, child custody following divorce has not always been handled the way it is today. Prior to the mid-19th century, divorce was rare and it was allowed only for limited reasons. Following divorce, it was standard for custody to remain with the husband and father. This was the situation faced by Carolyn Norton after separating from her husband. The end of her marriage was not brought on by circumstances that were approved reasons for divorce. Because of this, when Norton separated from her husband, he had complete control of her ability to see their children. Norton looked for uh, legal means to counter her husband's alienation of her from her children and found none. With no legal recourse, she began fighting to change the law. In the course of her activism, she had to counter predictions that if given a right to custody to their children or of their children following a divorce, uh, women would be more likely to leave their husbands and upon doing so would kidnap the children and flee with them. She replied to those predictions and other arguments with an essay titled Plain Letter to the Lord Chancellor. The result of her effort was the passage of the Custody of Infants Act of 1939. That and the Plain Letter were the basis for the Tender Years Doctrine, which was used for much of the 20th century as the standard on which custody decisions were based. The Tender Years Doctrine has since been abandoned for nicer-sounding Best Interests of the Child standard, but the determination of the child's best interest includes presuming true beliefs laid out in the Tender Years Doctrine, namely that young children are best off with their mothers. Custody is now awarded to mothers more than 80% of the time, and according to the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau, over 85% of all custody custodial single parents are mothers. Less than 15% are fathers. Feminists argue that the implications of this are debatable, claiming that fathers who file for custody get it most of the time. That claim is the basis for the assumption that fathers don't get custody of their children because they don't want it. However, when feminists claim that fathers get custody of their children whenever they ask for it, they're including joint custody. Uh, they're including joint custody agreements that are nothing more than material or maternal custody and per paternal visitation rewritten to recognize the father as a legitimate parent and afford him the ability to make decisions regarding the child's medical care and school attendance. In these agreements, the living arrangement of the child is the same as when a mother has full legal custody. Further, for a father to file for and be granted custody, he must first amass the funds for a lawyer and court costs. If his income is moderate or low and is already being reduced by a child support payment, he has little or no ability to fund any legal action. This situation means that women do not have to be financially stable to be awarded custody of their children, while fathers have enough money or have to have enough money to pursue legal action before the court will even consider awarding them custody. The result has been an increase in single mother households living under the poverty level, eligible for and collecting government assistance. According to the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau, custodial single mothers are more likely than custodial single fathers to not have jobs and not have enough non-employment income to be above the poverty level, to earn low income even if they are employed, to have custody of four or more children, and to, com to combine joblessness with multiple child custody and to become custodial parents as teens. Cutting fathers out of their children's lives can have significant negative impact on the child. Research by uh, Sarah McLanahan at Princeton University suggests that boys are significantly more likely to end up in jail or prison by the time they turn 30 if they are raised by a single mother. Bruce Ellis of the University of Arizona found that one-third of girls whose father left home before they turned six end up pregnant as teenagers 
compared with just 5% of those girls whose fathers were there throughout their childhood. Fathers' rights groups have sought custody or have sought remedy, sought to remedy the court's senseless handling of child custody by introducing and advocating for legislation to change the standard custody arrangement following an uncontested divorce. These laws introduced in both the United States and Canada would ensure equal time with each parent. This would also change how child support is handled, as equal time between the parents would mean that neither should be faced with a greater share of the child's living expenses. This would limit reasons for assigning a child support obligation to factors like differences in income or other personal uh, resources. The law does not make the equal time standard a set-in-stone requirement. If a parent does not want that arrangement, he or she can contest it in court. If different arrangement, they can sign a contract to that effect as well. Feminist groups have opposed the introduction of these laws related to equally shared parenting. In Canada and the United States, they've done so with writing that uses a dishonest representation of the law as an every case imperative and demonization of fathers as deadbeats and abusers to argue against the proposed standard. Reality does not back up their accusations on either count. While feminists accuse fathers of abandoning their children, 40% of mothers admit to custodial interference, meaning they're refusing their children's fathers the right to spend time with their children. While feminists accuse fathers of being abusive, data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services shows that the majority of child abusers are women. Nobody is arguing to make paternal custody a default standard to solve that issue. Faceless accusations and conditions uh, uh, which aren't gender specific are not legitimate reasons to oppose instituting equally shared parenting as the applied custody arrangement in uncontested divorces. As a society, we've seen the negative effects of cutting either parent out of a, a child's life. Wouldn't it be most beneficial to the child to ensure that he or she receives the benefit of both parents whenever possible? If the best interest of the child really is the standard feminists embrace, the most sensible way they can show that is by ceasing to oppose equally shared parenting initiatives. That opposition is not rooted in concern over abuse, but self-serving bigotry against men. And thank you for that, Hannah. Uh, very, very good summation of the issue. Um, I would like to actually uh, talk about something that uh, I found while researching feminist opposition to shared custody in Canada, which is the National Association of Women in Law. Um, you can find it at nawl.ca. And this is what they have to say. Uh, NAWL's briefs on custody and access. On a practical level, the issue of custody and access is often closely linked to that of child support. The 40% rule has proven especially problematic. The 40% rule says that the federal guidelines amount of support does not apply to any parent who has custody of the children at least 40% of the time. This has led to abuse by men who seek to evade their child support responsibilities by fighting for joint custody of their children. The father's rights lobby has mobilized in favor of a presumption of shared custody. The 40% rule is just one of the many issues of concern with current custody and access laws. Um, so they, they point out that uh, in, in other uh, feminist documents, they accuse men of uh, basically not wanting to have to pay child support. And I know that, Paul, you had a particular answer to that accusation that you, you, you told me la uh, on, sun on Saturday. So I'll just, I'll just step back and... <laughs> yeah, I've heard that a million times, and I have to say it infuriates me to no end to hear a woman's group say the only reason father's groups uh, want shared parenting is so that they don't have to pay child support. And like I said, that just infuriates me to no end. I can very simply respond to that. The only reason that uh, women don't want shared parenting is because they don't want to lose their paycheck and, and also um, – and ultimately control over their ex. Well, that's another one that I've heard that feminist groups uh, 
accuse men of is that they don't want they aren't, don't have an interest in their children. They just want to be able to control their ex wives' lives and uh, still exert a certain amount of ability to determine what she's going to do with it with her life. And I, I, I'm not sure where to go with that. I think that. I think that, I mean, it's possible with some people that they would want to continue and exert control. But to to oppose shared parenting initiatives based on, um, st- you know, outlying the minority of abusive people, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. Like abusively controlling people, it doesn't make sense when it's a rebuttal presumption of, of joint uh, or shared parenting. It's not a situation where the judge is going to, grant um, custody access to a provably abusive um, spouse or, or, or a person who's provably abusive to their spouse or children. So, and, and again, you were saying that this should be proven to a criminal court standard, not a family court standard. That's so, right. Yeah. Proven cases, and, and like you suggested, this bill, C-560, is a rebuttable presumption of equal shared parenting. We understand that not every that it, equal shared parenting isn't right for every single divorcing family. Just like sole custody, which is what we're doing right now, we are following a cookie cutter style of sole custody model. Ninety percent in Canada goes to mom, and if dad wants more than every other weekend visitor, then he's in for the fight of his life. And he has to hire a lawyer, spend his life savings just to get what he would be entitled to or should be entitled to by rights, not by uh, because who's got the more money. And he, I'll just quickly read a, 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 a quick um, non-custodial dad's nightmare that was published in a Barrie, Ontario newspaper during my elections awareness campaign when I was co-president of the Canadian Equal Parenting Council. Um, he writes, I'm a victim of, a gender, of the gender bias in the Divorce Act. I'm a 35-year-old single dad of two young kids. I'm very fortunate to have equal physical shared joint custody, currently four days with, four days without of my kids. Because of my shift work, I get to spend almost as much time with her with me as a stay-at-home mom. But being able to be with and raise my kids came at an excruciating cost mentally, emotionally, and financially. To achieve the right to have the same access to my kids As their mother, I spent two years in the family court system. I stood before six judges and spent my life savings on my lawyers. McDonald is right about the government's own commission recommending the law be changed. She's also right about the conservatives agreeing it needs to be changed, yet nothing changes. In the meantime, other fathers, like me, continue to clog up the courts, fighting to be with their kids, and yes, that even costs taxpayers more. I don't mind spending my life savings on my kids. Can't think of anything more important in this world to spend it on, actually. But I sure would have preferred to put it into their education savings fund rather than my lawyers. Your MPs, kids need both parents in their lives, and this needs to change. And, and seriously, folks, I'd really appreciate it if you've had any negative dealings with the family court systems you know what I'm talking about so now is the opportunity for you to get up off of your butt and do something about it contact your MP make sure he or she is in support of this bill make sure he or she is going to vote in favor of this bill in the next few weeks when it comes to the house for debate Yes, definitely, because uh, this is an opportunity to get something that should have been done a long time ago. Years ago. Years ago. And what's really heartbreaking about that particular letter is what you were saying before it is essentially he has to pay to be treated like a mother, essentially, and not even really get the same um, treatment as a mother, but but to be treated like an equal, you know, just... Without, and that's what's so funny about the uh, about the feminist charge that men are 
only in it for the money. Well, see, and, and in this particular instance, this mom and dad worked shift work. And while the marriage was intact, when mom was on days, dad was home the evenings with the kids. Or, you know what I mean, they just rotated shifts. So one of them was always home with the kids. And when they separated, he just assumed they were going to maintain the same thing. They lived both five minutes the other side of the school, uh, and it would have been very easy to do. But mom didn't want that. And mom, in Canada, moms have all the playing cards, and she played her no card. So he had to fight, and like he said, it's life savings, go through the emotional and mental nightmare of our adversarial system just to get what he had while he was married. Just to continue See that? the same. And in the end, he did get it, but like he said, at an excruciating cost. That right there is an, an obvious um, counter to feminists claiming that men are after custody for the money. I mean, this is a really common thing that men have to spend, you know, boatloads of money even just to be allowed into their children's lives when their their their, their ex wives become uh, controlling like this. The other thing I wanted to point out is um, the, the whole child support system, and this this is the other thing that feminists are claiming is that oh guys are trying to get custody of their kids to uh, get out of child support payments. But the whole child support system was set up to help single mothers overcome the fact that they could not earn as much money as, as fathers because legally their employers were allowed to pay them less because they were women. And they had a much li- more limited set of uh, jobs that they could apply to because they were women. They had much more limited earning prospects than they do today. And the uh, the system has not changed in conjunction with that. In fact, it's changed in opposition to it, where originally it was basically about supporting the family, supporting the kids, making sure that you know men didn't abandon their families and leave their wives and children in poverty that they couldn't get out of. Now it's like some sort of vindictive you know hammer that you hit guys with after divorce. Oh, you're going to be divorced? Okay, well, you got to pay this bill. It's, you know, we're going to say it's for the kid. But in reality, uh, because of what it was originally for, it's really not. It, it's really just a continuation of something. The conditions that, that, that justified it are no longer in place. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it definitely is true. Um, and uh, before we we go on any further with uh, the discussion, I do want to people to call in because it is a call in show. The number is three one zero three eight eight nine seven zero nine for this first bit. Before we get into um, the topic of Anita can save us from our sins, uh, I'm going to give preference to people who have questions for Paulette. So if you have a question for Paulette, please do call in now and inform our uh, inform James that you have a question for her and we will be giving you priority. So the number again is 310-388-9709. And uh <laughs> and uh so did you have uh anything else that you wanted to add to to your uh to your statement about the purpose of uh, of leading women for shared custody and the new bill that's going through um Anything at all, Paulette? Well, I would like to uh, just let the listeners know that Leading Women for Shared Parenting was founded based upon the simple lessons of history. When one looks at the history of the rights movements, the same, the same story is told in repetition. The question was not if African Americans deserved equal rights. They did. The question was, were white people going to be fair? The question was not if women deserved the right to vote because they did. The question was, were men going to be fair? This movement is no different. The question is not if children do it. The question is not if children deserve equal time with their fathers because they do. 
the question is, are women going to? And further, we have the benefit of already knowing the answer, as poll after poll has shown, between 78 and 87% of the public supports equal shared parenting. The only way to achieve such numbers is with the majority of women supporting our cause. When whites began adding their voices to those calling for African-American rights, the fight was over. When men started adding their voices to those calling for women to have the right to vote, the fight was over. Leading Women for Shared Parenting knows that when women add their voices to those calling for equal shared parenting, this fight too will be won. So again, I'm asking you to go to our website and endorse our shared parenting statement, please. And just real quick, uh, I have a quote here from M.P. Ignacia from a book he called The Rights Revolution. As a father, I find it hard not to be pained by the statistics of modern fatherhood and divorce in Canada. Mothers get custody in 86% of cases, and more than 40% of children in Canada's divorced families see their fathers only once a month. These groups demand that the custody and access regime created by the Divorce Act of 1985 be replaced with a shared parenting regime in which both parents are given equal rights to bring up their children. These are sensible and overdue suggestions. And the fact that they are being made shows that men and women are struggling to correct the rights revolution so that equality works for everyone. That's a wonderful sentiment. And uh, we're going to go now to uh, one of our callers. Nathanor. Nathanor, you're on the bridge. Hello, hello. Uh, as Hi. I as I mentioned there in the uh, chat, I'm not sure if you're able to read that or not, uh, my mother was actually one of the people who fought for uh, the alimony to go across the uh, borders in uh, Can between Canadian provinces. As When she divorced my father, she went from Ontario all the way out to B.C. And, of course, she wanted to get her money from him. So I'm definitely behind supporting this bill. This is something that is so needed to be changed for the longest time. I just wish it had come around a lot sooner. You and me both. Who's your MP? You know, honestly, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. I'm out here in Alberta. Well, uh, you can also sign the petition too, right? Uh, oh, Paul? yeah. I'm men can sign? Absolutely. We do have men in as well. Um, but mainly that statement is for women, aunts, uncles, mothers, sisters. But yes, we do have men that support it. Yes, and definitely call your uh, MP to talk about uh, whether or not they support C560 of the Shared Custody Bill. Did you have anything else you wanted to add, Nefanor? No, just I'm glad somebody is doing this because it's about bloody time it needed. Yeah, thank no, you. No, no <laughs> shit, right? Uh, again, the call-in number is 1-310-388-9709. That's 1-310-388-9709. We're talking now with uh, Paulette McDonald, who is, from, is representing Leading Women for Shared Parenting. And... Uh, she is promoting the new shared parenting bill that's uh, in in Canada, being proposed in Canada. The, B, the bill is C560. So if you are interested in promoting shared parenting, please go to her website. Her website is L, uh, Leading Women, lw4sp.org, and sign a petition and uh, talk to your MP about this bill. It's very important that you that we do something to push this forward. I heard uh, that uh, you were, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you were you were involved with an earlier bill that died, uh, that ended up being... it. Yeah, it died on the order paper when Parliament was prorogued. And uh, when I moved to Oshawa and met with my new MP to 
gain his support on this. Uh, near the end of our meeting, when I informed him that this is the second time that MP Bayak has is this bill, uh, because the last one died on the order paper when Parliament was prorogued. And he looked at me and he said, whoa, well, that was wrong. That shouldn't have happened. Um, but I was so excited with how our meeting played out, and he is a big supporter of Equal Shared Parenting. He will be voting in favor of it, and um, he will be uh, requesting a meeting for me with the uh, Justice Minister, Peter McKay. Uh, when I, after I left the meeting and I thought about it for a few minutes, I thought, wait a minute, did he say that shouldn't have happened? And uh, sure enough, I did a little bit of research, and they changed that law in 2003 that bills no longer died on the order paper. So we did a little bit of juggling, and um, ordinarily you cannot vote at second reading, uh, but doubt that they, we are, the House is going to be permitting voting uh, at second reading, which is supposed to happen first or second week of March. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, that's great news. And I want to thank Nefanor for the call. And uh, I also want to thank you, Paulette, for coming on and telling us about your organization and about uh, pushing this bill, getting, getting attention to this bill, because it is really important to start uh, looking at shared custody and getting it moving. Um, and uh, I mean, not just because it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it seems like a no-brainer, right? It seems logical. Yeah. And what is it, uh, three-fourths of Canadians actually agree with this bill? That's correct. It's amazing that, it, you know, it, it's amazing that it takes so long for the politicians to come in alignment with the common sense of everybody else, right? <laughs> well, and... and in talking with several different ministers, their argument there would be that while 80% of Canadians support equal shared parenting, 99% support um, health care and 100% support the economy. And I said, well, <laughs> then my argument is that our existing family law system is strongly impacting both of those. Yeah. Well, certainly. Our health care system and our economy. Well, and not just that, but also criminal. Uh, yeah. All of, the, all of the money that we spend on uh, housing criminals, exactly. uh, rehabilitating them. I mean, in many cases, we would solve a lot of that just by keeping the father in the home. Um, and uh, they, that... Fathers do have an effect on their or opening up, expanding the horizons of their children, so they don't have to turn to crime as the only yeah. solution for for their for the situation that they situations that they find themselves in. Um, but again, I want to thank you, Paulette, for coming on and uh, and bringing attention to this issue and 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 for your advocacy for shared parenting. Once again, uh, please go to Leading Women for Shared Parenting, that's lw4sp.org, and sign the petition and look at the information there and see how else you can help um, this, this initiative because it is very important. And did you have anything else that you wanted to conclude with or any final thoughts, Paulette? Just that we have some wonderful information on our website. We have, uh, if you go to our website and check out our research page, you'll have all the latest, greatest uh, research materials at your hands, at your disposal to provide your MP with. We also have polling and voting page, which uh, demonstrates the equal shared parenting popularity within society and our politicians. And once a society knows that an injustice is being done, we have a moral, ethical, and spiritual obligation to address this problem. And I think our media and our government should be ashamed because they both know this problem exists. So I am asking 
why I'm asking why this has gone on so long and why haven't you done anything about it? So we're asking them now to please support Equal Shared Parenting Bill C560 and do what's right rather than what's easy and be a voice for our innocent children caught in the crossfire of the two people they love most in the world. And with that, I'm going to say good night. Thank you so much for having me on. And um, well, thank you for hoping that Canada changes. Yeah, here's the hope. Yeah, well, it will. It just it's just a matter of time. And thank you again for all of your your advocacy work for shared parenting and for coming on and informing us about it. And uh, it will change. The change will happen. It's just a matter of how long. How long. Uh, media and uh, politicians are going to remain obstinate about this issue. But thanks again, Paulette. Um, I'm going to... Thank you for having me. And if anybody wants to join me on Facebook, because I do the bulk of my advocacy work there, you can join me, Paulette MacDonald, M-A-C, in Durham Region. Okay, thanks. Thank Um, you very much. um, And uh, just uh, once again, the number is 1310-388. 9709. When we go after we go, we're going to go to a commercial break, and then we are going to dive right into Anita can save us from our sins. So the number again is one three one zero three eight nine seven zero nine. Thanks again, Paulette. Thank you. Uh, ow! You dragon, you evil monster. Oh, hello everyone. Didn't see you there. Angry Harry here. Still fighting after all these years. So don't forget to visit angryharry.com to arm yourself with cognitive cluster bombs. Bombs with which to blow the wicked feminist to smithereens. Ah! Oh! Ah! Would you like to have your own men's rights blog without the usual red tape? Antimissionary.com has a ready-made stage and an active audience waiting to read your MRM blog. Free speech and open thought are encouraged at the passionate Antimissionary.com. Take advantage of a long-standing community of activists committed to solving planetary misandry. A decade of investment in your future. Antimissionary.com Hey everybody, this is Aaron Cleary, a.k.a. Captain Capitalism. I have a new book out called Bachelor Pad Economics, and it is not optional. It is not optional. You need to know this stuff, boys. It's basically the financial advice Bible for men. It carries you from the age of 14, like auto repair, maintenance, school, college, career, entrepreneurship, all the way until your death. So if you haven't had any kind of training, your parents haven't sat you down and taught you about financial planning, this is the book you need. It's available on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle.
Welcome back. Once again, today's topic for this part of the show is going to be Anita can save us from our sins. Yep, Anita saves. And the call in number is 1 388 9709. So if you want to share with us a story of how Anita came into your life and helped you turn to the light, please do call in because we want to hear from you what you think of Anita how you feel she's touched your life, how she's improved it, how she's made you feel, given you hope for a brighter future, a future free, and a future free of misogyny, a future where women don't weep, where they are proud and happy and have total control over their environment and nothing at all offends them. Everywhere they look, It's just a field of daisies, a field of daisies, a beautiful field of daisies, calm, serene, no trash talk, no cruelty, no damsels in distress, nothing but absolute feminist bliss. And I know that Anita has shared this vision of feminist bliss with you, and we want to hear how she has come into your life, how she has touched you, and how she has elevated you in soul and spirit. Um, I want to introduce Sage. Hello, Sage. You're on the Hello. bridge. Hey, how you, you have a story of how Anita has touched your soul. Yes. Uh, see, Anita has touched my soul, and she has taught me that when it comes to video games, I have actually been silently brainwashed by the, these patriarchal misogynistic values, and not everything that I ever do is in, is in some way oppressive to women, and in some way damseling women in in terms of. <laughs> I can't keep doing it. <laughs> no, no, I think she's a total bitch. Um, but um. <laughs> Well, to be to be honest, like to be fair, and again, if if you do have a story about how Anita has touched your life, for better or for most likely worse, 
please do call in. This number is 310-388-9709. I mean, to be fair, Anita really isn't the sort of concentrated evil of other feminists. Like, I mean, you look at Mary Koss, I mean, she's she's like, I, I don't know where the hell she came from. She's like a reptilian alien or something. And the mind is just unfathomable. Uh, and then there are other feminists who just, just are far, far more toxic than Anita. Anita's sort of the Disney uh, theme park version of feminists, possibly because she's a complete con artist and doesn't even believe the shit that comes out of her mouth. But, you know, at least she's not as bad as she could be. I'll give her that. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so I know that's pretty faint praise. Mm-hmm. But I am going to uh, go to... Cassaval, all. do you have a story of how Anita brought light, light into your life? Light into my life? More like syphilis into my life. <laughs> syphilis. Brain mm-hmm. syphilis, the worst kind. Okay, so what did uh, you... Uh, so, um, what were you going to talk about? Yeah, yeah. the light, the light can be radiation, just so you know. Yeah, so the light can I be radioactive. It's dose, like a super lethal dose. Super lethal dose of radiation. Anyway, um, so I was I had completely forgotten she existed until I saw the uh, announcement for the show, and it was quite shocking to me that Anita is going to get an award from the Game Developers uh, Conference. It, I mean, if I if you can make a bunch of pointless videos that have almost zero substance to them and get an award for a game developer, what does that reduce game developers down to? It's been this really bad um, problem within the industry that they're pandering a lot to, um, like, just to be so politically correct, when I found a lot of stuff that drew me to gaming is they wouldn't be so politically correct, and they'd, they'd do something different, but now it's almost, in a way, poisoned, I guess. Catch any of that? Oh, looks like we we may have lost our host. No, our... you didn't lose me. I was just hiding. I was hiding. I was in hiding. Oh, I can't, I can't. that's not good. I was in hiding from the Anita radiation or the brain syphilis or something. But uh, sorry, could you repeat your last sentence? Because I'm I'm having trouble. You're quite muffled, Cassidal. Oh, I talk very quietly, sorry. That's okay, um, just get a little closer to the mic and talk a little louder. Well, I can't do that unless I start eating my phone. But anyways... Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't do that, but you're good now. Go ahead. Um, it just feels like um, the gaming industry used to be so politically incorrect, they wouldn't pander to certain demographics, but now you seem to be getting more and more poisoned by political correctness and well, sometimes it can be good. It can be good in the same way a cheesecake is good. You know, it's good to indulge in a cheesecake once in a while, but Christ, if you eat it all the time, you're, it's just not good for you. Mm-hmm. Is political correctness ever good for you? I mean, theoretically, is there, is there a situation in which it's good? Can you think of one? Well, if you're going to burn it off later with more political incorrectness, so exercise in a way. Oh, I see. So it's it's sort of like resistance training. You do a little bit of political correctness so you can be more in, politically incorrect later. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think political correctness is just a desire to uh, to do emotional bullying um, through affectations of greater morality. Um so I, I don't really have a lot of sympathy for it. I think people know when they're being mean and being mean, and you should maybe not be mean, but sometimes being mean can be fun, so I don't know where you draw the line, but political correctness just seems like bullying to me. I don't, I, I haven't seen a situation in which it's improved anything, but maybe I could be wrong. Um, maybe, maybe Hannah can explain to me a situation. So I don't know. Oh, um, 
uh, political correctness. Honestly, I think political correctness and, and the uh, the stated sentiments behind it, where you kind of accuse everybody else of being sexist or racist or any other ist you can think of, is more projection than anything. It's the idea of policing language as a means of controlling people and, and using accusations of, uh, of of ill intent, um, of malice, really, where malice hasn't necessarily been displayed. And it, it's not to uh, confuse um, political correctness here with ordinary human consideration for other people. Like, obviously, if, if you know... Yeah, because I mean, if you know that there that, that a word is a slur against a group of people, then it's shitty of you to use that word, and everybody knows that. I don't think there's anybody, um, at least not in in uh, the first world, that is ignorant of the fact that that using a slur is a, a shitty thing to do. People who do it are 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 doing it, you know, because they're careless of other people or they're mean. But the idea that you can't talk at all without offending people is is really fake. It's not so much um an an act of consideration such as as refraining from using terms that are known slurs would be an act of consideration as, as more of an act of control. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um it's definitely an act of control. Um I remember the link that uh someone sent to me. Oh god about the game industry's response to Anita and just post after, for some, uh, somebody was questioning Anita and he got banned from this game forum. Probably someone will chime in with the exact particulars of this, but it was like I was reading this as post after post after post of white nightery about how it, the exact same situation for men and women is different when it happens to women because uh, women... I don't know. Women, I guess, just can't handle the trash talk. They just can't handle dealing with this kind of a situation where people are not being polite with each other. Because why? Why? Why can't women, women handle that? Like, wh- why is it that uh, that we can't see women as being capable of dealing with this kind of stuff? Sorry, go ahead, Campbell. Or is oh, that no, Sage? No. Oh, this, this is Sage. Go ahead. I just I just got unmuted, so I, I wasn't sure. Uh, yeah, but and no, the uh, the thing I wanted to add into that was that when it comes to um, th- this weird culture with the white knightery that you're discussing, one thing that I really really get worried about is when they continue making these suggestions that in some way uh, two demographics just can't relate on an issue, a- and when they take this uh, notion that they're, that two demographics can't relate whatsoever, they use this as an excuse to uh, continue shutting down opinions and making sure that in order for you to actually have some sort of qualification in any discussion or even to deliver criticism of any kind, you have to have experience in some scope that somebody else, you know, stipulates. So basically, uh, you're, 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 you're given this... Um, you're given this box that you're never allowed you're never allowed to get in, but you're told if you want to have any authority or any credibility in this discussion, you have to be in the box and experience something we'll never let you experience and we'll never let you relate to. So I, I, it's just it's just a bunch of shit, and it's it kind of uh, ties into these um, a lot of the same uh, kind of standpoint theory uh, knowledge of social construct uh, construct stuff and how that can kind of get bent out of shape, but. I really don't think that this is a in any way a, very, a healthy discussion, and it really has to be noted that the control of rhetoric has to stop. Well, all I know is that, God damn, does the white nightery piss me off. Like, it's just like, I, I don't want to play your damsel. Like, I, and the funny thing is that the, I remember distinctly in this one of these long threads on one of these game sites on Anita that there was this, this this guy who's like, well, look at all of these white guys weighing in on the on the experience of women, and he was a white guy. You know, he's like, <laughs> okay, well, I'll weigh in on the experience of women. I I think that she should suck it up. I've looked at her wall of hate, and it really was maybe about. I don't know, uh, 50% aimless flattery, 
40% uh, pointed criticism, and maybe 10% not even particularly vicious internet trolls. So suck it up, Buttercup. That's what I think. Cassival, did you have anything else to add? Uh, just two quick things. One, um, you can, there's actually a um, games industry website where it's um, people who only – the only people who post are actual people who work in the industry. And um, they actually did a piece uh, a couple of days ago about her getting an award, and the comments on it are pretty much split down the middle between white knights and people using their brains. Um, it's actually quite fascinating to uh, read. Just uh, search Game Industry International, um, Anita Sarkeesian, and it should pick it up. I would post a link, but um, the chat box is a load of bullshit and shit. And last thing, for anyone who ever would listen to Anita, they need to remember, truthful words are not beautiful. Beautiful words are not truthful. Well, I can buy some of that. Um, beautiful words can be truthful. The thing is, they, they aren't always. And, and the same thing with truth. It isn't always beautiful. But it, if you are able to actually anal uh, analyze what you're hearing for logic and reason, as opposed to listening to the emotional aspect of it, you can sort them out pretty well. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of Anita's biggest problems, is she doesn't deal so much in the logic and reason of the topic that she's discussing, but in how it makes her feel and how she can make other people feel about it. Um, I think that's one of the biggest problems, why she ends up in these... these uh, you know, these accusations of uh, misogyny in gaming and, and the idea that women are reduced to damsels in gaming, which isn't necessarily the case. And um, the other thing I had wanted to say um, earlier, didn't get a chance, but uh, Allison, when you were mentioning the idea of um, feminists complaining about white males talking about the experiences of women, one one thing I'd like to point out about that, because we hear it all the time, as soon as a guy starts talking about um, the, the male side of the experience, the frequency of the experience, and, and trying to insert any kind of common sense into the discussion about the experiences, it's, oh, you don't know anything, you're a white male. They never bring that up when the guys are agreeing with them. And they'll push those guys forward as soon as they're agreeing with them. And, and highlight them and, and pull them out, hey, guess what, these guys agree with us, we must be right. And as soon as the guys disagree, then they're all white males and they can't possibly know anything. Yeah, it is pretty hypocritical. But what's really amazing about this whole situation is just the level of persecution complex that it's inspiring in, in women. Like, these people honestly believe that men have it out for women. Like, in order to accept their premise, you have to believe that men deliberately target women, that men have it out for women, that they want to hurt women. And first, I think that once your ideology requires you to believe that um, a group of people is basically inhuman, then uh, there's something wrong with your ideology, not the group that you think is inhuman your ideology. <laughs> it, they, we, there should be some sort of red lights and sirens when people get to that point in their ideology. If your ideology requires that, you, that a group of people be inhuman to work, to be subhuman to actually function, then you're, there's something wrong with your ideology. But, you know, reading through these, these comments of these white knights on, on Anita Sarkeesian, and I noticed there was somebody from commenting a man from Bioware and I'm like oh god please shut up I don't want to have to never buy another Bioware product for the rest of my life because of you white knights I don't want to support you anymore uh, but uh, just the, the sheer what they were promoting the attitude the, the level of, of persecution that they were promoting as an idea for, as like a as what women live in and really, it doesn't make any sense because, first of all, the only study that I've seen on this issue found that, for example, male journalists receive as much harassment online as females. There's no evidence that women receive more harassment. 
they may receive harassment t- tailored to being women, just like men see, receive harassment tailored to being men, but women really don't receive more harassment. And there's no proof that they do. There's, these people are running off of no proof. Their only proof is their emotional belief that women are somehow being persecuted by men, that men have it out for women. Um, And I find it amazing that they can never accept that men don't have it out for women. And the reason why saying that men have it out for women is such a powerful concept and makes people jump up and scream and and march and put up banners and, and take away due process rights is because it's the opposite. Men really care about women and want to protect them. And, and, and it's a perfect way for people that really care about women want to protect them and constantly say, oh, you all are targeting women. You all are targeting women. It's like the perfect way of controlling men. Oh, you are targeting women. If you don't do exactly what I say, you're targeting women. And the only reason it works is because men are exactly the opposite of what feminists are saying they are. Oh, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Go ahead, Sage. Oh, um, well, on the subject of the of white men and this, um, I think a lot of it had come goes back to the uh, the kind of feminist narrative that when we hear a lot about uh, diversity, intersectionality, and things like that. And I think that there's the hypocrisy can go in different directions there, where it kind of has to start with this assumption that all white men think alike and it's a uh, and it and it's the only way you can get something new and something more objective is if you kind of if you mix up the demographics and this i think is an incredibly uh racist notion and even sexist notion simply because it starts from the assumption that if you look different you think different and it's a um another thing that uh I want to bring up is that there's that uh, the director of managing director of Ubisoft Toronto, Jade Raymond. She um, even was quoted in uh, Develop Magazine uh, issue 128 that uh, a what can a bunch of identical white 32 year old males who shop at Gap or wear the same pretty games T-shirts offer that's new unquote. And she's uh, been writing that entire she's been writing that entire same context as well. But what's interesting is that she looked at Anita Sarkeesian and said that she was too picky. Like, she, uh, she didn't really elaborate on that. And this was uh, the experience from a, a guy that actually got a chance to talk to her. And I'm just thinking, like, what exactly, where exactly do feminists draw their standards on diversity and intersectionality? Because I think this is where they get this bullshit narrative on uh, what exactly, uh, how exactly demographic ties into these conversations. I mean, that's just an open question I want to leave out there. Well, if I can answer that, uh, it it certainly is a great question because do all black people think alike? Do all people who use wheelchairs think alike? Do all women think alike? I mean, I I don't even understand the concept of diversity in in this context. It really doesn't seem to mean diversity of opinion. It just means diversity of superficial physical aspects that we will consider that correlate to opinion, but often really don't. Um, There's no reason to believe that 10 different 32-year-old white guys wouldn't have 10 different opinions. Right. Yeah, diversity means no white men anyway. That's what it means. Yeah, basically. And I think... um, some of the some of the feminist narrative on uh, diversity, well, I don't know. This is kind of hard to say, but I think some of the feminist narrative on diversity is their own internal racism and their own internal sexism coming out. Um, and they're more, you know, you know, the concept of of the token minority or the token female in a group. A lot of the the diversity initiatives that they discuss where the effort is simply to collect groups of people based on superficial characteristics, whether it's minority status or religion status, a gender, that's basically just tokenism on a much bigger scale. And there's no difference between that and saying, well, we want to have a black person in this group so people won't know we're racist. We want to have a woman in this group so people won't know we're sexist. It's it's no different. 
it's just bigger. Yeah, definitely. Um, I was thinking that uh, when um, when we do this, it, it's a really contemptuous attitude, this idea that our opinions relate or have some sort of one-to-one relationship with our physical aspects, very superficial. And um, in terms of... Uh, what, but what can you expect, really, from, from feminists and from Anita as, as an incredibly superficial analysis of the issues? Obviously, if people are different physically, they must be different in, in some sort of fundamental way uh, in terms of their opinion. Of course, they would say the experience is different. But here's another thing that's pro- sort of problematic about this. By focusing on these so-called, these what we call minorities, um, we're always focusing on how they are acted upon, how they are victimized. Not what they can give to the group, but what they deserve from it. And that also is sort of very contemptuous because they're saying that these groups of people are defined by their weakness, essentially. And, of course, women being the penultimate group defined by its weakness. uh, (laughs) Yeah, it seems like an incredibly contemptuous attitude to have towards these groups. Um, not just tokenism, but the idea that these groups are defined by by their weakness and what they deserve to get from the group rather than what they can give to the group, which giving to the group generally is a very individualistic thing. So maybe that's where it's coming from. It's almost like a, uh, a communal group mind sort of thing going on. But anyway, we're going to move on to another caller. Thank you, Casabal. And I'm going to move on now to Vagabond. Vagabond, you're on the air. Greetings, all. How's everybody doing tonight? No, we're doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Okay, I'm doing pissed off because I cannot believe this woman is getting an award for what she did. No, 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 no. She's going to be sainted I, 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 at uh, some geez. point. I mean, geez, like, uh, what can you say? Feminists deserve sainthood because they're 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 showing us the way. You know. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let me just uh, you know, greet everyone around the room. Hello, uh Della. Hello, um Hannah. Um, uh, Hannah. Brova, uh, uh, Hannah. Okay, fine, yeah. Hannah. She changed her well, name. She'll always, be, she'll always be Della to me. Okay. <laughs> There's probably a song in that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. And uh Brohoff, uh Allison. And yep, um, Brohoff. And um Victor, uh, you are psycho fabulous. I loved your video on um, uh, uh, named Your Mind. Your little psycho crazy rant uh, uh, convinced me that you could have replaced Heath Ledger. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Okay, I mean, some... okay. yeah. Go ahead. No, I just need some red lipstick smeared all over his face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Oh, I've been meaning to ask. Um, I've been meaning to ask Victor. Did you? Uh, were you quoting something there? Oh yes. Uh, you mean from the uh, thing related to the Jade Raymond stuff? The oh uh, no. The um. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure I have that line memorized in my head. Let's see if I can pull it off the top of my head. It's um. No matter how much alcohol you drink, no matter how wide the shit-eating grin gets on your face. You're mine. I don't think so. I, I don't think it was anywhere else. But um, uh, we're. Uh, I, I think it's kind of off topic, though. I mean, I appreciate the, yeah, the yeah, comments okay. from the video, but yeah, let's let's get back to the um, yeah the stuff we yeah, got yeah. Yeah. here. But I pre- I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, you know. Uh, okay. I, I was. I'm. I'm an '80s boy. I was born in '81, so I've seen the. Uh, the um, development of the video game over time and I took some classes in game development and the fact of the matter is before you get a game from uh, from programmer to shelf it's got to be playable regardless of its aesthetics or its story I mean those are just you know um, psychological triggering objects that that um, push you along I mean do they actually think that games are are uh, I mean these these uh storylines and things are all that games are about? 
do they think? Yeah, I mean uh, Anita in particular, because I mean she, that's all. That, is, is that all she's been focusing on? Well, I, I think that I think what's um, really concerning is that uh, I mean it could be argued that when you're selling a game, you're selling an experience, right? I mean, uh, I, I've also done game development my, myself, but more as a hobbyist thing. And you are absolutely correct that there are so many uh, different aspects that go into developing the game, and it's not just story. You have so many concerns regarding like how do you handle media how you handle QA and things like that. But when it comes to um, Anita, I think that she's um, she I, she's one of those people that thinks that people can be, anyone can be brainwashed by glowing rectangles. I mean, it's just a matter of you put a product in front of their face and, and on TV, on video games, and basically people will believe whatever the game or show or whatever tells them. And it, it's, what's really crazy is that it's this, suggestion that somehow everybody is gullible and impressionable. And Anita runs on this assumption that everyone is too stupid to tell the difference between reality and fantasy. And any common conventional storyline that doesn't agree with the feminist narrative is in some way brainwashing the masses to in some way be okay with women being beaten or raped or what the fuck ever. I don't get it. I just don't get it. And yeah, you can get an award for it, so whatever. Yeah, jeez. I mean, that's that's seriously irresponsible. It's seriously irresponsible. Um, okay, when it comes to the the um, you know the 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 mental aspects, in particular the my uh, I, um, I am I'm assuming most men's uh, favorite uh, triggering um, object would have to be the damsel in distress. But may, may, I could be wrong. I could be I could be right on that. But from the standpoint of someone who's who's been uh, raised on this like kibble. Um, they always uh, feminism always always takes a standpoint on that, and that it 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 works because men see women as weak. It doesn't have anything to do with women. Okay, you're breaking up really bad. Hello. Check, check. Hello? and completely died. Check. One, two. One, two. Check. Okay, One, two. who's here? Who's That's here? That's Vagabond. Can you okay, hear me? Vagabond. Yep, I need you to relax. We've got a good check. All right, Vagabond. Good deal. Okay, if anybody else is hearing, uh, this is EVFM Radio Director James Huff. And yes, while I understand we are having some issues with blog talk right now, rest assured, I am working on it very hard. Okay, well, I, I, I don't even have the ability to mute myself. Imagine that. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't even have the ability to mute you. So uh, anything that the, uh, so the, a, anything the, uh, that you would like to say, because <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't take you off the air without ending the ending the show. 
Well, I think the uh, <laughs> mental syphilis seems to have come through the lines. <laughs> but, um, geez, I forgot where I was last uh, before it started breaking up. Um, uh, can you still hear me? Is the line going again? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep going here. Um, okay. Uh, that's, that's all I, I may hear you. <laughs> Oh boy. Well, if I can allow to be allowed to tap dance while uh, while we try to get our host back, I was just uh, I think I was just saying that um, uh, the emotional triggers that they put into video games, in particular the damsel in distress thing, wouldn't work if we hated women. It only works because we love women, just like they were saying on the last caller, and. Um, you know, the feminists refuse to take a look at this from a biological standpoint on men in, in asking why do these things work with men and uh, the innocence behind that, really. I mean, it's, it's not completely, it's not really our fault that, that, that a lot of things work on us because they, um, they rely on our instincts. Right. Right. Uh, commentary? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I am about to do something a, a little bit uh, crazy here. Uh, give me just one minute. Um, oh, Hold boy, down. this is going to be lots of fun. Hello? Well, look at that. Typhon Blue is on the air. Go ahead. Yeah. Start. Keep, keep, keep it rolling. Keep it well, rolling. Well, damn it, I'm, damn it. Jim, I'm not a chatty Cappy doll. You can't just pull my string and... Please. Okay. Well. Well. Thank you, I, I, well, since, <laughs> well, since you're on, Tyson, I, I, I was um, I was gonna ask you something since uh, we're uh, we're both uh, we're both bronies here. Um. Uh, Sage, mute yourself on your. Yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> okay, welcome back, Victor. Okay, if everybody wants to know, this is a general show announcement. If everyone wants to know why our sound is so shit, it's because of blog talk. Every <laughs> week, there's like a race between, well, it's like a race, it's like Indiana Jones with Boulder coming down the hill. And we're racing before it to try to get the show done before we get crashed by blog talk's crappy system. So, it's not us. It's not our headset. It's not um, our our mics. It's blog talk. Absolutely. That's well, uh, we've we've got, anyway, uh, we've got um, uh, Hannah on as well. Yeah, uh, you had a question Welcome for me back. there. Uh, yeah, thanks. You you sort of held. <laughs> which is thank you. You're the <laughs> caller that sort of kept the show going while all the folks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm glad to be a credit to the team. Um, it still is a, it, oh wait, hmm. sorry. Uh, Vagabond is now the new host of Honey Badger Radio. There you go. I take my badge okay. of honor honorably. And um, so you had a question. You had a question. Well, I'm wondering if there are, see, you know, as as a brony and uh, as with your understanding as, uh, of bronies, I. I, I have come to the understanding that I like the show because I do like to bask in in the feminine essence in all its beauty here in a very pure sense. And I'm wondering are the, if if there are any actual um, women gamers, female gamers out there that actually like to play male-centric games and just like it to enjoy some of the virtues that are presented in the games. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I actually am not would not consider myself a gamer personally. Although I really like games, I tend to avoid them because I get sucked in and then I don't do anything else. Um, <laughs> they have a tendency to do that. That's true. Yeah, I I I had to sort of give that up after Halo Reach, and I spent about uh, two days and I didn't sleep or eat playing that game, and then I was like, you know what, um, if I, if I want to actually do anything with my life, i gotta, I got to make a choice. <laughs> Pay games it, or it, it, it can be true. It can be true. It, it can tend to sidetrack, but sometimes I, I occasionally use it as a device to um, help uh, bring down my energy level and, and help me focus on something directly. So it can be used as something positive. 
Um, it can, it can, yeah, it, no, for I, example, I have nothing yeah. against games. I have nothing against games. It's just something about them is it, it, it's just very, so compelling for me that I sort of have to swear off them. Um, and, uh, well. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it's it's it just is it is uh, it's not a not a slight against games. It's more about me, my thing, right? My issues. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I I personally, but then I'm not really the most feminine woman, so uh, I don't know if I'm the right person to, to answer that question. But yeah, I I do sometimes just not want to have to deal with femininity and just spend some time in a more masculine realm uh, or what we consider more masculine. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I would agree. Um, although I, I do like My Little Pony, the 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 thing is that sure. I don't find the show necessarily as feminine as all that. You know, it, it does have a really solid plot, really solid characterization, um, and a certain amount of action as well. Um, That's true. I uh, since we're since we're just basically geeking out. Uh, <laughs> Oh no, James Huff says get it off the pony stuff and back on Anita. Okay, Damn. fine, fine. R- ruin fine, fine. Our fun. But, yeah, um, well, I mean, we really can't do much in terms of the show because we can't take any more callers. Pile on Lord. Anita. Hi, Hannah says oh, pile on, on Anita. Well, on, on Anita. Anita. Okay, I, you know what? I don't. What? I don't really want to do anything on Anita. I, I prefer to what? keep myself. Very separate from her personal being. I don't know. Um, what, can you tell me what what, that, what, 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 is, what her uh, what her award is going to be for? Did, did they give a specific on it? Uh, uh, give me give me just an one moment. Award. It's an ambassador award for somebody who brings the games industry to a better place. And I'm quoting a better place. That's where I got the whole religious iconography from. I was like, what? Who the hell says? Bringing us to a better place. What the hell does that mean? A I have no place. idea. But she, I mean, she's like the okay. Messiah. I see the game Utopia. We can all get there. You just have to. You just have to believe in my word. You know, it's it's ridiculous rhetoric. Go ahead. There's you know, I mean, product. It, a better place yeah. is on get going off the shelf, off the retail shelf, home with somebody who paid for it. That's a better place for a product that is sold in retail stores. But there's no other better place. Ah, boy. You know, okay. As far as uh, games being a product are concerned, that's true. It's a, it's an entertainment thing. But the thing is, also, it's a, it's been, it has been used in the past to. Uh, to deliver, um, like like programming, like television programming, to deliver a moral message and to and to open your eyes towards things. It's 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 malleable. It's just a tool. But I mean, the thing is, if we keep pandering to the feminist mentality on this, it, every stitch of ground we give is just a step towards losing the whole field. You know, today it's just it's just about sexism. Tomorrow it's it's a or, or perceived sexism, I should say. And uh, de- then demonizing the uh, demonizing the, uh, uh, the the male the male psychology. Tomorrow it's about complete control, and and uh, you know it's about taking over the shop uh, the coffee shops and not being able to to let men or or any, or anyone of the sort um, just converse and 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 congregate without without big sister feminism watching over our shoulders. It's, well, I think it's really more about um, control than it is about uh, morality. And I think most forms of morality, uh, I think a lot of, of so-called moral systems are more about control than they are about creating a system that allows people to just live with each other. And I, I don't think feminism is any different. I think it's very religious. Um, it's very righteous, and it's, it's very simplistic. And like most religious systems, it needs a Satan, and it's Satan are, is men. I mean, quite literally. I, I, I remember being in Reddit, and uh, I, I got into this discussion with a feminist on Reddit, um, and uh, I described to her that 
when I learned that men were, in, in, in all probability, equally likely to be raped as women, and then by rape, I mean physically forced to have sex. I don't mean the, the regret or coercion or unwanted sex statistic. That plus, re, plus learning that most rapists were themselves abused really took a weight off my shoulders because it, it, I went from being a situation where, you know, everything around you is telling you that the men, men are your enemy or you're being targeted by men for, for, for this, these sexual crimes to realizing that, and I, I fully agree that that is an incredibly misandrous attitude, but I let it go, right? I moved past it. And learning about these statistics helped me do that. And it was a huge weight because off my shoulders because, you know, half the population around me was no longer my enemy, but in fact my ally. And um, this, this feminist says, well, you, you admit that you're a misandrist and all of the, you're just projecting your own misandry onto feminism. And then I said, do you think that men target women? And two, three days later, she still couldn't answer that question. She did everything in her power to avoid answering that question. She had said that I was a misandrist because when I was younger, I had actually absorbed all of this cultural rhetoric about men and thought that men were literally targeting women. And she couldn't even answer the question. I mean, she asked me, do you think women are targeting men? And I said no. And, uh, I mean, just like that. It was an easy question to answer, but she couldn't answer the question three Freaking days, two or three days, I tried to get her to answer that question. She did everything she could to divert it. She even said, oh, I answered it all way back in this 200 uh, comment thread on this particular comment, and look at the comment, and it's not even answering what she said. is Feminists are not required to believe that men target women. That wasn't my question. My question is, do you believe that men target women? Couldn't answer it. And that's really what this entire, I, I think that's really telling. Um, exactly, the, um, and the, that that, that was her her answer. It was an indirect it was an indirect no, but she was just too too prideful to actually admit that no, because I think it was an indirect yeah. yes. She truly did believe that oh. men target women, and if you actually ask these people, I mean, if you if you nail them to the wall on this, True. they these people believe that men target women. They believe that men are out there targeting women. It's not all men that are critical mass of men. Enough men that actually create a society that, that would, would conform to their idea of patriarchy. And it's a really ugly belief. And the reason why she could never say yes, um, she couldn't say no because I'm almost certain that she did actually believe that men target women. And that would have been a lie to say no. And she couldn't say yes because she knew it was an abhorrent belief. And it is an abhorrent belief. And really, once you, you, you're with a group of people who has that belief that, you know, this particular group of people is targeting them, um, you know, that, that's, these, are, these are the bricks. These are the ideological bricks that build a genocide. And it's, it's more than just uh, not being able to play games or having uh, feminists encroach on games. This, this whole rhetoric of men targeting women. And the thing is that you, you can't deny it. Feminists promote campaigns like War on Women, Name the Problem, with a man's face superimposed on all of like rape, violence, mugging, um, criminal, like these words with a superimposed over a man's face. I mean, every single thing out of feminist mouth is a persecution complex about how men are targeting women. And it's, 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 so, yeah, maybe it's about, you think it's about maybe making the game industry more palatable to women. No, it's just about control and power and, and trying to put the thumb screws to the undesirable group, I think. You know, just, I mean, yeah, just take one, away. I mean, go ahead. Well, every time I, I hear that argument that we're just trying to make the the, the game industry more palatable. I mean, tell somebody to go make something that's a little bit more palatable. Don't don't you know complain to the, the stuff that's already working is is all is what I always say. 
because frankly if they want a more uh, if they want something more uh, more um more to their taste they should ask and tell they should pay for the development of one because there's not always a guarantee that it's going to come through and and bring a profit <sighs> Um, you're really breaking up. I think we're going to have to let you go. Um, uh, I'm please. really sorry, Vagabond. Um, but uh, from what I can tell, what you said, you, you were talking about a game has to make a profit. Is um, that right? What they, if they want a game that's more palatable to them, they should pay for it, for the development. Yeah. Well, well, if there was if the thing is that this is the easiest thing for women to solve. If you don't like the games that are out there, buy games that you do like. The, the, the reality is that the game industry isn't dominated by female interest because women don't buy games. Um, or if they do buy games, or if they do play games, they play Farmville. You know, it's it's it's. If you want to have control over a consumer good, you have to buy it. And what Anita is trying to do is give women control over a good that they don't even want to buy or have anything to do with. So and exactly. the funny thing is, is, we don't even, would we even have this conversation about romance novels? Do men go out of their way to say that, um, to say, you know what, we're not going to buy romance novels, but we want to have control over it. We want to make sure that you women are learning stuff about how to respect us men. I mean, even listening to it, it sounds like a freaking, you know, like a, the worst caricature, feminist caricature of the 1950s man, right? You know, I'm going to make sure my, my little woman's literature is respectful of my role, right? And yet that's exactly what they're doing. Like Anita is doing, she's essentially saying, uh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna overlook this genre in w- that women don't really buy, and make sure it's respectful for women who don't buy it." You know, it, it, how is that different from men creating some organization and saying, "Well, romance novels have to have to reflect what we believe is respectful towards men." But it's it's absurd. I mean, when you, when you when you when you uh, flip the genders, it's absurd. Uh, are you still there, Vagabond, or have we moved on? I'm sort of I'm sort of flying blind at the moment. So. Well, oh, well, we we are no longer flying blind because fortunately, for the last 15 minutes of the uh, show here, I've got great news. I've got full control of everything once again. Okay, well, that's good. Unfortunately, we only have 15 minutes left, so we can really only take one more call. <laughs> okay, well, we'll tell well, you, you all. Know, you know what? We've, we've, got a, we've got a caller who has actually been waiting here. Uh, Dean. Dean. Yeah. You, okay. You, so, right. Dean, welcome to the show. Uh, hello. I Hi. actually had a... Uh, little bit of insight that I'd like to share. Uh, it mainly has to do with from the, uh, the game development and publication side of things. Now, uh, there's kind of a relationship between the gaming media, uh, the people who like publish reviews about games and talk about games and generally you know, make a lot of money talking about games, you know, which uh, Anita has decided to throw herself into, and the game publishing side of the business. Now, uh, in, when you're publishing a game, you obviously want to make sure your game sells well. Now, but when you, uh, in order to make it do that, you need to make sure people know about the game. And game reviewers and game journalists, so people who talk about your game and get people to know what you know that your game is out there and let your game get sold. So there's kind of a symbiotic relationship there between uh, the game journalists and the uh, game industry, as it were. But there's also a big rule in game marketing that you want to control the message. You want to make sure that as much as possible, good messages get said about your game, and you want to kind of silence the bad ones. And this has been a practice that's been going on for easily 10 years or so. I mean, it's probably been going on longer than that, but I've been in the industry for 10 years, and I've seen it happen constantly. 
Uh, and so that's basically uh, what's going on now. Is that uh, I think it, it chimes in and, and kind of strikes a chord with uh, the game industry in their practice of controlling the message that Anita has managed to, you know, she, she, she is harmonious to that idea of controlling the message and making sure that only uh, the words you want to see get out there are broadcast. So I, I think that there might be a, a little bit of a subtext to the fact that she's getting an award for that at this year's Game Developers Awards. A sinister subtext. Hello? Do you hear me? Sorry. It, it's, I'm, I can hear you a little bit, but it seemed to be breaking up here now and then. I don't know exactly how well I'm coming through. Uh, you seem to be coming through okay. I'm, I'm guessing that I'm going robo. No, no, I hear you just fine. Keep it rolling. All right. So, uh, no, I said it's a, it's a sinister subtext so that uh, game developers and Anita both share a desire for control. Well, I, wouldn't that, I wouldn't necessarily say that game developers share that message. There's a bit of a disconnect between the development side of the industry and the publishing side of the industry, whereas the publishing side of the industry is much more dominated by the, the corporate idea that you need to sell, 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 and the developing side of the industry seems to be more interested in making games. But at the same time, there's a lot of overlap between the publishers and the developers because, you know, Developers also want to make sure that their games sell too, so they can keep making games. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm sorry for uh, for conflating the two. Uh, I meant to say marketers rather than developers. Um. Well, I think that there's always a, a big uh, overlap between feminism and people who desire control. Certainly, feminism and government seem to go hand in hand. Which is really ironic, since wouldn't government be the patriarchy? But <laughs> oh my! Um, well, thanks for your call and thanks for your uh, for your comment, uh, Dion. Dean? Dean? How do you say your name? No, that, that's fine. Uh, and okay, it's been a you. pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, Keep it's a been a fight. pleasure to have you guys. Apologies for the the, the sound issues. Um, and uh, blog talk sort of deciding to die on us. Uh, we had a question in the we had a question in the chat from Durakin. Oh goodness, you people! We have such insane names. Dura, Durakin, Durakin. Okay, Honey Badgers. Do you think as a writer I should write in such a way that it isn't realistic to the characters or setting, so that I conform to being polite or sensitive to any group? I think you should write in such a way that you reveal some sort of human truth. Um, I, I don't know if it's uh, if it's intelligent to be intentionally um, provo- well. Yeah, I guess intentional provo- provo- provocation is good too. Just write well. That's all I have to say. Just be a good writer and have something interesting to say about the human condition. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know what, I'm just going to go and pull in a wild card. Uh, I apologize if you're on and you're just listening because I'm about to pull someone. I have no idea who they are. They haven't been screened. I don't even have a name. I'm just going to pull them on and talk to them. Hello, unnamed person. You're on the air. Silence. Okay. Let's see what's behind door number two. Hello. You're on the air. The long Hello? sleeve, the short sleeve, and the uh, button up. Uh, I, am, I, I to... am I am I am I breaking up? Are you breaking up? Hello. Okay, that didn't work. I think we've got two trolls in a row. This is hilarious. Okay, let's see what's who's behind door number three. Hello. Hello. I have no Hello? idea who you are, but hi. I see your call Hi, voice. my name. Uh, my name's Michael. Okay, uh, Michael. Hey, uh, I was just calling as a longtime gamer. I've played MMOs for about 17 years now. 
I started out in uh, EverQuest and have moved through World of Warcraft, and now I'm in, actually it was funny, you mentioned Bioware earlier and what's going on in Bioware. And um, as a, as a long-time gamer, it's funny to me that it was a boys' club. I mean, I remember back in the 80s when Nintendo tried to purposely tried to market to women and girls. They went so far as to make pink Nintendo boxes. Do you remember that? That back in the mm-hmm. 80s they actually had pink oh, I, Nintendo I remember boxes. That. Yeah, they, I mean, they I tried very, very hard. Before. Um, they tried very hard to market Nintendo to women or, you know, to gaming video games to women, and it just didn't work. And it became a boys' club, not because women weren't invited, but because women weren't interested in in playing the games. And here we are, the ones that were didn't want pink boxes. Right, exactly, exactly. It was just, you know, the the vast majority. And I go back to my experience with, you know, in in EverQuest back in – you know, starting in 98 and 99, um, there were no, I mean, it was a desert. I would say for every thousand gamers, one was a woman in EverQuest. Now you move to modern day in World of Warcraft, one out of, I think it's one out of every seven gamers in World of Warcraft is a woman. You go to Star Wars, uh, The Old Republic, and it's, I think, one in every four is female. And they've come in, and they were invited, and, and it was a happy thing. But then, you know, everybody was glad that women were playing. And now, but then immediately, as soon as women start being integrated into this, you know, this social experiment or, you know, this this new, you know, kind of uh, subculture, then all of a sudden the feminists want to rush in and, and dominate, you know, the, the strictures that are set up for it. I mean, because Anita has done nothing but call men misogynists who game. There's no cure. She's offered no cure. She's offered no fix. It's just, oh, by the way, you're all misogynists. And then she cries when yeah, people... Yeah, that's the other thing. Hey. You know, I mean, that's I'm sorry the that thing. because I like to play. Um, Go ahead. They never offer you a way of... They, they give you these, these hoops that you have to jump through, but they don't say where the hoop is, how big is it, how big it is, if it's on fire, if it's not, um, what way it's orientated. Like, it's just this, you're a misogynist. You can never actually change that fact by doing anything specific. If there's no way, it, it's completely vague. Um, it's just a completely vague situation. How, how, do I do, how do I stop being misogynist? You know, yeah, how, how exactly. do I... How do I give up my male privilege? Not not me in particular, because apparently I don't have any. Well, actually, no, I have proxy male privilege because I am a uh, patriarchal help meet mate. So, <laughs> but it, so you get by proxy I'm, male I'm, privilege. <laughs> yeah, I got my proxy. How do I give up my proxy male privilege? You know, because I'm 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 a surrendered wife. I'm just this incredibly submissive, fainting flower. Um, sorry. Go ahead. I wanted to uh, interject another uh, story here. Um, one of my, uh, I, I'm one, I, I love games, and there's some, uh, there's some games I like more than others, of course. And one of my favorite uh, Nintendo series is uh, Metroid. And now Metroid was a series where you're playing as a bounty hunter named Samus Aran, and the American pronunciation is Samus Aran, and I refuse to use that name. But there's a, um, with Samus Aran, as you know, a bounty hunter, and she was uh, defined as pretty much a bona fide badass. Uh, pretty much her whole premise was land on the planet, blow it up from the inside out, and go off without using the restroom or eating. But um, eventually the, uh, the series has been going on like that. She's a silent protagonist exploring an alien world, and you get to enjoy the solitude of it all. And it was really an awesome atmosphere. But then they came along the latest uh, game in the series, which was called Metroid Other M. And they, it was her first, it was the first game where she was given a speaking role. And um, they turned her into this massive infant. Like it was this uh, horrendously awful character. And they made it so that she would break down crying um, and, and just needed approval from the, uh, like approval from her like daddy figure in order to use any of her uh, equipment and she needed a big burly man to help her. And then the, uh, they, were, they hired a new studio for this, right? And they were going to a new studio from the previous ones. 
and the guy, one of the guys that was uh, behind this, you know, he was saying, well, nobody liked Other M, you know, we made the game, but nobody liked Other M because they had issues with women. They had issues with, you know, I mean, this, is, this guy fucking destroyed the character, and he turns her into the kind of stereotype, this kind of a completely took away everything that made her not like, you know, what feminists were complaining about, and, and they instead turned her into the kind of stereotype that feminists would complain about, and then project onto every male gamer hatred, like saying everyone is a misogynist because we fucked up the game. Like it's, this is the kind of bullshit that you have to deal with. Even if you have a character that is actually pretty cool and actually doesn't have any sort of real, it doesn't have such a gender dimension where it's clearly not about, oh, look at me, I'm a woman and look how amazing I am. They instead take it so that they twist it so that the woman is actually put in this position where she looks like that stereotype, but it's not the developer's fault. It's everyone else's fault because they're all misogynists. And what is going on? I, I just don't get it. It's, it's just another one of that this bullshit things where even if somebody else fucks up, it's not their fault. Okay, I think it's well, just a situation where no one has any solutions, to be quite honest. They just have feels. And there's no there's no movement towards anything, but unfortunately I'm going to have to cut you all off because guess what it's about that it, we're we're minutes from the end and we got a we got a close up shop so um, that's what I'm going to do I'm going to close up shop but first I'm going to thank the listeners and the callers and everybody who got dropped I apologize on behalf of Blog Talk. Um, so, not much we can do when, when Blog Talk just decides to almost completely crash on us. But thank you for calling in. Even if we didn't get to you, please do call in again, and we'll try to get to you next time. And I want to thank my co-hosts, Jenna and Sage. And uh, I also want to thank Phil for, uh, well, he didn't animate the ad this week, but he usually does. And uh, assumably, assuming after he's done his vacation, he'll start next week. And I also wanted to thank uh, Europa for the wonderful show art every week. You guys got a lot of talent. He puts a lot of heart into his art. And I want to thank James for keeping the show running smoothly. And uh, the Reddit crew, Men's Rights Reddit, for putting our sticky up for this week. It's been a bit of a rough ride tonight, but we're at the end. So thanks for listening, and uh, tune in next week. Same Badger time, same Badger station. This is Honey Badger Radio, reminding you to take the red.